Pues, buen día, buenas noches. Es un placer eh, inaugurar este panel sobre el costo y la efectividad de la planificación familiar posparto en la región de las Américas en la pandemia del COVID-19 a partir de las perspectivas mundiales. Para la FIGO, a la cual represento, es un honor compartir este panel junto con la Sociedad de, la, de América Latina, que es la FLASOC, al mismo tiempo con el CLAP, institución y centro en la cual muchos de nosotros, los ginecopsetras de América Latina, hemos pasado por sus aulas y su centro de entrenamiento. Felicidades por los 50 años. Como FIGO, eh, nuestra institución podemos claramente, con la investigación realizada por el doctor Arul Kumarán y todo su equipo, somos la institución que mayor experiencia tiene con el dispositivo intrauterino posparto. Por supuesto que existen otros métodos de largo alcance que van a ser tocados en esta conferencia y eso va a tener un impacto importante en términos de salud pública. Esperamos que este webinar aclare la duda de todos los participantes, que sea todo un éxito en beneficio y el bienestar de las mujeres de nuestra América Morena. Muchísimas gracias. Se estima que alrededor de unos 214 millones de mujeres en edad fértil en, la, en regiones de bajos ingresos desean evitar un embarazo, pero no están utilizando ningún método anticonceptivo moderno. El acceso y el asesoramiento integral sobre la planificación familiar y la selección de los métodos permite que las mujeres retrasen o espacien sus embarazos y por lo tanto puedan planificar su familia. Este seminario va a tratar sobre una estrategia especial que es la colocación del dispositivo intrauterino posparto. Es un, como lo decía el doctor Fusner en nombre de la FIGO, es para la Organización Panamericana de la Salud y la Organización Mundial de la Salud un gran honor y una gran alegría poder compartir eh, este momento con todos ustedes. Antes de comenzar eh, ya directamente con el seminario, quisiera darles algunas eh, indicaciones y algunas instrucciones sobre cómo va a funcionar este seminario. Este seminario está siendo grabado y va a ser compartido a través del canal de YouTube de la Organización Mundial de la Salud y del canal también de FIGO. En la parte de abajo de su pantalla, in the down part of the screen, you can see the interpretation button. Van a poder ver el botón de interpretación. Este seminario está siendo traducido al inglés y va a ser expresado en inglés y español. Por lo tanto, si el speaker habla en inglés, ustedes van a poder escucharlo en español utilizando el botón de interpretación que está abajo, hacia la derecha, en su pantalla. Pueden seleccionar el inglés o pueden dejar en el idioma original. Pueden escuchar el idioma original, inglés o español. Esto eh, va a ayudar mucho a hacer el seguimiento igual que para las preguntas. Ahí están mostrando cómo eh, podemos utilizar eh, en inglés o español todos los eh, elementos de este webinar. Tenemos ya cerca de 100 personas conectadas, estamos por comenzar y hay más de 400 personas inscriptas. Yes, there is an English option. You can go down in your screen at the right side. You will see the interpretation bottom. You can select the language that in the language that you want to participate. Could be English, could be Spanish, or just not clicking any one of them. You will have the original language that people will be speaking. Uh, Some of the panelists will be speaking Spanish, 
and some will be speaking uh, English. I will speak Spanish and people will need to uh, click in the bottom of the English translation if they want to listen that in English. Say that la agenda que tenemos programada para hoy es una agenda eh, muy ambiciosa, muy participativa y de verdad un honor tener a los que, como dijo el doctor Fuschner, los que más han desarrollado y los que más saben de esto esta mañana con nosotros. Eh, vamos a tener un momento de apertura eh, institucional, ya nos dio la bienvenida el doctor Fuschner a, en nombre de la Federación Internacional de Ginecología y Obstetricia. Luego el doctor Iván, Edgar Iván Ortiz nos dará la bienvenida en nombre de la FLASOC, la Federación Latinoamericana de Sociedades de Ginecología y Obstetricia, como expresidente. Luego la doctor Susan Cerrulla, como directora del Centro Latinoamericano de Perinatología, nos dará sus palabras de bienvenida y de inmediato empezaremos a compartir la información. Primero analizando por qué en este momento es importante para la región el utilizar la estrategia de anticoncepción posparto inmediato utilizando DIU. ¿Por qué? Luego se va a compartir la perspectiva de el, la costo-efectividad eh, desde una perspectiva global. Esto va a ser presentado por el profesor Aru Kulmarán, que fue el director de esta investigación. Eh, finalmente, van a haber dos presentaciones ya yendo al, al núcleo duro de la investigación, que es el análisis de la costo-efectividad en Tanzania y Bangladesh, y finalmente el, la costo-efectividad de los implantes también provistos en el momento del posparto inmediato, eh, Christian Wall de la Universidad de Emory va a compartir con nosotros la investigación. Al final vamos a disponer de casi 20 minutos para preguntas y respuestas. Durante las presentaciones no se van a permitir preguntas, pero sí están abiertos los canales de interacción. Si ustedes ven abajo, en, el, en, en la parte inferior de su pantalla, eh, van a ver preguntas y respuestas, question and answers y chat. En question and answers, ustedes pueden inmediatamente, cuando surja la pregunta, escribirla en el chat. Una vez que está puesta ahí, vamos a ocuparnos de al final, en estos 20 minutos, de responder a todas las preguntas que, que, que logremos avanzar. Pero si tienen algún comentario especial para los panelistas, que no sea una pregunta o quieran compartir eh, documentación, publicaciones o lo que fuera, va a ser el modo en que nosotros vamos a compartir con ustedes eh, IBP, que es The International Best Practices Network, coordinado por Nandita Tate y eh, por Ados May, que son nuestros anfitriones en la mañana de hoy, nos van a ayudar en compartir los documentos con ustedes a través de esta vía del chat. O sea que mantengan eh, interesados, este, manténganse interesados en mirar lo que está en el chat, que aquí, como nos está mostrando ahora Ados, además de haber preguntas, van a haber eh, y agradecemos los saludos desde México, desde Paraguay, desde Brasil. También vamos a poder compartir con ustedes eh, documentos, información y sobre todo publicaciones, como esta publicación específica que se hizo en la FIGO, en español y en inglés, que tienen los resultados más importantes de la investigación del elemento de costo-efectividad. Así que con esto eh, quedan ya declarado abierto el simposio y el encuentro y quiero eh, pedirle al doctor eh, Edgar Iván Ortiz si por favor en nombre de la FLASOP puede dar las palabras de bienvenida e inmediatamente después la doctora Susana Sarruz. 
gracias, doctor Rodolfo. Eh, muy buenos días para todos. En primer lugar, agradecer a la Organización Mundial de la Salud, a la Organización Panamericana de la Salud y a mi querido CLAP por eh, permitirnos participar en este importante evento eh, dando un mensaje en la ceremonia de apertura. En ese orden de ideas, eh, como Federación Latinoamericana de Sociedades de Ginecología y Obstetricia, la SOC, queremos hacer un llamado a los gobiernos de la región de las Américas para que garanticen la proveeduría y disponibilidad de los insumos necesarios para la planificación familiar post-evento obstétrico y la eliminación de barreras que imposibilitan el acceso a ellos por parte de las mujeres, situación que ha empeorado por efecto de la pandemia por COVID-19. De igual manera, queremos convocar a los trabajadores de la salud que intervienen en el proceso de atención del parto, personal de enfermería, médicos generales y especialistas en obstetricia y ginecología de cada una de las maternidades del continente a promover y estimular cambios en las actitudes y prácticas de nuestras gestantes que favorezcan la aceptación de la planificación familiar post evento obstétrico como una práctica saludable que sin lugar a dudas tendrá una profunda repercusión en la morbilidad y mortalidad en embarazos futuros, especialmente en aquellas mujeres con condiciones de riesgo y vulnerabilidad extrema. Como FLASOC, estamos comprometidos con difundir estas iniciativas y generar en lo posible un cambio en la actitud de los profesionales que aún cuestionan la costo-efectividad de los diferentes métodos disponibles, en búsqueda que no egrese una mujer post evento obstétrico de una maternidad latinoamericana sin consejería en planificación familiar e idealmente sin la aplicación de un método eficaz que minimice los riesgos futuros asociados a los embarazos no deseados, no planeados o en condiciones adversas para su normal desarrollo situación que compromete su salud y la de generaciones futuras. En nombre de nuestro presidente, doctor Samuel Karchner, agradezco su participación, su invitación para participar en este importante evento y les hago llegar a todos los asistentes un afectuoso saludo de bienvenida. Muchísimas gracias. Muchas gracias, doctor Ortiz. Eh, quisiera comentarles que en esta iniciativa de FIGO, Seis países con más de 700.000 mujeres recibieron orientación sobre planificación familiar y alrededor de 75.000 mujeres recibieron DIU postparto. Lo que vamos a compartir hoy no solo es un planteo teórico, sino es la profunda implementación de un eh, proyecto de investigación que se convirtió en un programa de salud. Doctora Susan Cerrulla, por favor, adelante. Buenos días a todas, a todos. Entiendo que ahora va a entrar el video. Sí, Ados. Eso es. Imagino que todas las madres y los niños van a, a tener una posibilidad mucho mayor de, de ejercer los derechos que, que están. Imagino que todas las madres y los niños van a, a tener una posibilidad mucho mayor de, de ejercer los derechos que, que tanto proponemos y, y deseamos. Que los embarazos sean deseados y planificados en virtud de lo que venimos trabajando, que va a haber una importante reducción en la mortalidad de causa prevenible. En ese sentido, en ese vínculo y diálogo entre la evidencia científica y la generación de políticas, creo que el CLAP es donde ha tenido y va a seguir teniendo una incidencia muy importante. El gran desafío sería tener para 2030 alcanzar, no solamente en el promedio del país, pero también al interior de cada país, en cada provincia, en cada estado, para cada grupo poblacional, tener la mortalidad materna por debajo de 35. Eso yo creo que sería un logro muy importante para la salud y la calidad de vida de la región. Con el compromiso político de los gobiernos, con la participación de las sociedades, de las comunidades y con la cooperación técnica, con todas las herramientas técnicas que tenemos para apoyar este esfuerzo. La vocación de CLAP es cuidar. Lo que nosotros hicimos durante 50 años y queremos hacer muchos más 
es cuidar a las mujeres y a los recién nacidos. ¿Y cómo se cuida bien? El cuidado va desde la promoción hasta la vigilancia y a la atención de la salud. Se cuida bien con buenas prácticas, con humanización de la atención y con el uso de la innovación tecnológica. Es a eso que nos dedicamos hoy y los días futuros lo pedirán. Que seamos cada vez más innovativos, pero que siempre pongamos en primer lugar la atención humana a cada una de nuestras mujeres recién nacidas. Pedrinhas, com pedrinhas de brilhante para o meu pai. Buenos días a todas, a todos. Muchas gracias por la presencia de todos ustedes. Es un honor celebrar los 50 años de CLAP con tantos invitados eh, tan importantes. Me permiten empezar a decir que CLAP cumple 50 años y que en estas cinco décadas estamos siempre trabajando para mejor formación de los profesionales de salud usando la investigación y la implementación de las mejores prácticas. Nosotros estamos en un momento muy especial donde pensamos el futuro bajo una situación muy nueva para todos nosotros, del punto de vida de salud, de vista de salud, social y personal. Y es muy importante en este momento que nosotros seamos capaces de ser innovativos, de no dejar nadie atrás y cuidar de la atención a las mujeres y recién nacidos. Nosotros hoy vamos a hacer exactamente eso. Vamos a hacer, organizar, celebrar la vida de CLAP, los 50 años, hablando de una intervención que en muchos aspectos, de recursos humanos, de recursos de salud, de recursos financieros, es una intervención muy costo efectiva. Y trabaja en un tema que es una de las actividades más importantes en la disminución de la mortalidad materna es la planificación familiar. Dar a la mujer el derecho, la elección de cuándo embarazarse. Un tema que es un tema de derechos, we have an issue with the de dar un cuidado cada vez mejor a la We, I'm sorry, I, we have an issue with the interpretation. If you speak in, Pani, in Spanish, you must be connected to the Spanish uh, channel, audio channel. Otherwise, in English, the sound of what you say, okay. the interpretation is the same level, and it's not possible to understand. Thank you. Ahora, ahora lo escuchan? ¿Lo escucho o no? Yeah, it's good sí. now. Thank you. ¿Sigo Perfecto. o empiezo? Bueno, entonces yo les hablé de la alegría de estar con ustedes, de la importancia de este webinar, de esta celebración con amigos. Entonces desde CLAP, Rodolfo va a presentar lo que es una de las intervenciones más costo efectiva que venimos trabajando en muchos países en su implementación. No puedo terminar sin agradecer a Rodolfo y Ana que desde CLAP trabajaron en esta reunión y también a nuestros socios. Tenemos el honor de tener hoy Carlos, Ados, Nanjita, Iván, Anita, Christian y el profesor Almud Karanan. Son, eh, yo diría que si nosotros una de las veneces de la pandemia es que nosotros logramos reunir un panel único para esta celebración. Así que les agradezco muchísimo que estén. Espero que aprovechen la reunión, aprendan más y puedan conseguir que en cada país, aún con la situación de pandemia que será larga, nosotros garanticemos, garanticemos todos los derechos de las mujeres 
en salud sexual y reproductiva. Muchas gracias. Rodolfo, no te escucho. Rodolfo, tenés el micrófono cerrado. I have to use the Spanish or just no interpretation. I Ahora me pueden escuchar. Sí, ahora sí. Perfecto. Eh, bueno, ahora me toca presentarme a mí mismo, presentar un poco qué voy a compartir con ustedes en los próximos minutos. Y la idea es poder revisar cómo esta magnífica iniciativa de FIGO, que fue desarrollada hace algunos años en África y en algunos países de Asia, cómo aplica perfectamente a nuestra región de América Latina y Caribe. La siguiente, por favor. Vamos a poder mirar que... Eh, a, a eso, gracias. América Latina y el Caribe tienen la tasa mayor de embarazos no buscados o no deseados de, la, de todas las regiones. Si pueden ver, en verde está América Latina y... En casi todas las regiones, el embarazo, la tasa de embarazos no planificados fue descendiendo. América Latina tiene mucha dificultad en ese descenso. Por lo tanto, estamos hablando de que hay una proporción muy grande de embarazos que no fueron buscados. La siguiente, por favor. Dicho en palabras muy simples y con un gráfico muy simple, la utilización de métodos anticonceptivos eh, modernos varía ampliamente la seguridad de la que, de anticonceptiva y por cada 100 mujeres que utilizan el método por, durante un año, muy posiblemente si las mujeres tienen las trompas ligadas, la proporción sería de 0.5% de embarazos que se lograrían mediante la falla de ese método. Hay otros métodos como, por ejemplo, el coito interrumpido o el uso simplemente de espermicidas, donde la tasa de fallas es muchísimo más grande. Y hay otros métodos, como por ejemplo el dispositivo intrauterino y los implantes subdérmicos, que tienen una tasa de efectividad aún mayor que la ligadura tubaria. La tasa de fracasos es de 0.05% para el implante, y de 0.6 para el dispositivo intrauterino, variando un poco si es un dispositivo que libere el evonorgestrel o cobre. De todas maneras, ¿qué, quiero, ¿qué queremos reflexionar con esto? Que cuando hablamos de métodos modernos, hablamos de un amplio rango de efectividad clínica del método, una efectividad teórica y una efectividad práctica. Por lo tanto, cuando hablamos de métodos de larga duración reversible, Estamos pensando en los métodos que tienen la mayor eficacia. Por lo tanto, en una región donde el embarazo no planificado es tan importante, no podemos quedarnos muy tranquilos utilizando métodos que tengan baja eficacia. La próxima, por favor. En este contexto, en América Latina, en medio de la pandemia de Zika, investigamos junto con la Organización Mundial de la Salud cómo estaba el uso de los dispositivos intrauterinos en la región. La, un clic más, por favor, Ados. Y ahí podemos ver que la conclusión de, este, de esta investigación, donde pudimos ver si había políticas escritas sobre el uso del dispositivo intrauterino, si había acciones concretas de implementación en planes nacionales, vimos que el dispositivo intrauterino estaba muy poco usado en la región de América Latina y el Caribe. O sea, o sea que esto, aún en medio de la pandemia, de, de la epidemia de Zika, perdón, el uso del dispositivo intrauterino era muy bajo. La siguiente, por favor. 
Y así vemos que cuando todos los usos, un clic más, cuando todos los usos del de dispositivo intrauterino son considerados, veíamos que en 15 de los 18 países que habían sido evaluados, había alguna política que hablaba de la inclusión del dispositivo intrauterino. Pero cuando hablamos específicamente del DIU postparto disponible en las maternidades, en las salas de parto, vimos que la mitad de estos países tenían realmente disponible, aun cuando había una política. O sea que son dos escalones que las mujeres tienen que romper, quebrar de barreras que el propio sistema de salud pone para el acceso a los dispositivos intrauterinos postparto. Puede estar en políticas nacionales, puede estar escrito en las mejores guías que las sociedades de ginecología han cooperado con los ministerios de salud para tener y en las recomendaciones clínicas de las sociedades de ginecología, pero cuando llegamos al análisis de si están disponibles realmente en las salas de parto, vemos que en la mitad de los casos estaban disponibles. La siguiente, por favor. Y ahora, mirando la realidad actual de América Latina, vemos que América Latina, y ustedes lo pueden ver por el color oscuro que tiene nuestra región en este mapa, este mapa es de la semana pasada, esto se actualiza todas las semanas, vemos que América Latina es el epicentro de esta pandemia, de la pandemia de COVID-19, eh, o SARS-CoV-2. Entonces aquí vemos que tanto Brasil como Estados Unidos han liderado el número de casos, luego seguidos también por Argentina, Perú, Colombia, Venezuela. O sea, hay los países de la región, con la excepción de Uruguay, todos tienen transmisión comunitaria y se ha demostrado que es un momento crítico, con eh, momentos de, eh, que no tenían antecedentes en nuestra región del el grado de desarrollo y gravedad de esta pandemia. En medio de esta pandemia, la siguiente, podemos ver que el número de casos nuevos, si se fijan en amarillo, están la región de las Américas, y el número de muertes. Hemos tenido en el inicio un número de muertes muy grande y luego se ha estabilizado. Si bien el número de muertes en la región de las Américas no es tan grave como lo que se produjo en Europa y en Asia, pero sí tenemos un incremento sustancial de casos nuevos y por eso decíamos que el centro de la pandemia en el mes de septiembre y desde el mes de abril en adelante de junio en adelante, es la región de las Américas. Por lo tanto, esto ha hecho que los países cierren sus fronteras, disminuyan en muchos casos la prestación de atención primaria de salud, disminuyan en muchos casos la existencia de acceso a nivel primario de salud y de promoción de la salud. Además, los proveedores de salud, los profesionales de la salud en la primera línea, son los primeros que han enfermado y han quedado diezmadas las fuerzas de trabajo, especialmente en la primera línea. Otro elemento es que la cuarentena ha limitado la circulación en los países, pero también ha limitado los vuelos en los que los países reciben la, en los insumos de anticoncepción. Por lo tanto, hay un insumo disminuido, circulación disminuida en el país, y además empobrecimiento de los presupuestos de los países que han tenido que destinar grandes montos de dinero a combatir y a controlar esta pandemia. Por lo tanto, la planificación familiar tiene que ser de alguna manera priorizada. ¿Por qué? Porque sufre rápidamente la población el impacto de la ausencia de la planificación familiar. Podemos ver en la siguiente cómo el Instituto Guttmacher ha podido calcular que el, una de las grandes amenazas es justamente el impacto de la pandemia de COVID sobre la vida de las mujeres. Y así calculando solamente un 10% de disminución en un escenario muy conservador, se ve que el 10% de la reducción de anticoncepción reversible nos llevaría a 15 millones adicionales de embarazos no planificados. Si consideramos la base de los 132 países de medianos y bajos ingresos que se tomaron como plataforma, los cuales muchos están en nuestra región. Así habría también 48 millones adicionales de mujeres.
Rodolfo, you're on mute. I'm sorry. Perdón, ahora, ahora está, ahí está, no sé por qué se puso en mute, pero ahora sigo. Decía que tendríamos 15 millones de embarazos no planificados adicionales, tendríamos 28 mil muertes maternas y 2 millones y medio de muertes neonatales. Reducción de los anticonceptivos reversibles y de corto y de largo plazo. También, dado el lockdown y las, el cierre de la circulación en muchas de nuestras ciudades, hace que las mujeres no accedan al control prenatal y tampoco al control del, del parto en, y del recién nacido. Así vemos también que el 10% de los abortos que cambiarían de seguros a inseguros llevaría a mil muertes adicionales maternas y llevaría también a 3 millones de abortos inseguros adicionales. Una cosa que en nuestra región se diferencia un poco de África es que los partos en general son partos institucionales. Entonces, un momento donde la mujer sí va a estar en contacto con el sistema de salud va a ser durante el momento del nacimiento, el trabajo de parto y el parto. Aun cuando, con algunas excepciones, hay países que tienen una disminución en el parto institucional, pero en general la gran mayoría de los países mantienen la proporción de partos institucionales. Por esa razón, cuando priorizamos la intervención de un método efectivo, como lo mostramos, realmente que protege a las mujeres, no tiene más complicaciones, y se da en un momento crítico donde la población de mujeres pasa a través del sistema de salud a una institución de salud, como el momento del postparto inmediato, sería un momento crítico de, de mayor seguridad para implementar esta intervención que es tan efectiva. La siguiente, por favor. Nosotros quisimos ver también en la región, y publicamos el año pasado en Lancet, un análisis de 23 países en América Latina, con alrededor de 200.000 mujeres evaluadas, cuánto es la proporción de mujeres que están utilizando actualmente en nuestra región métodos de larga duración reversibles como el DIU y el implante. La siguiente, por favor. Y así pudimos ver que la inequidad evaluada por el índice de inequidad que está expresado en este eje, tiene una relación indirecta o sea, mayor inequidad, tiene que ver con la menor cobertura de métodos modernos. Esto fue establecido en este análisis y pudimos ver que los países que tienen menos inequidad tienen mayor cobertura de métodos modernos de anticoncepción. Esto quiere decir que la política pública tiene que ver con el desarrollo. La siguiente, por favor. Ahí podemos ver la distribución en verde oscuro de los métodos de larga duración en los países. Esto está tomado desde las encuestas de demografía. Por lo tanto, el, la robustez del dato es, es muy buena. En verde un poco más claro los métodos de corta duración y en verde aún más claro la proporción de casos de mujeres con eh, ligadura tubaria o métodos permanentes. Y así vemos que en general, en la región de América Latina y el Caribe, alrededor del 10 al 11% de los métodos modernos de anticoncepción son de larga duración, con una dispersión entre Cuba, que tiene el 25% de los métodos de larga duración, o Belice, o, Sur, o Surinam, o Haití, o El Salvador, que tienen solo el 2%, o menos del 2% de la proporción de los métodos son de larga duración. Tenemos un gran, gran espectro, por lo tanto la intervención en estos diferentes países debe ser distinta también cuando pensamos en el refuerzo y en el sostenimiento de la intervención de la colocación de los dispositivos intrauterinos, que por lejos son el método más costo efectivo, dado que el costo es muy bajo, y la efectividad se prolonga hasta 10 a 12 años. Por lo tanto, el, la costo-efectividad, repito, del dispositivo intrauterino es la máxima 
que se obtiene de cualquier método anticonceptivo. Aquí podemos ver la diferencia de acceso a los métodos entre los países. La siguiente, por favor. Y los invito a mirar dentro de cada uno de los países la diferencia que existe entre los quintiles más pobres y los más ricos. Los más pobres son los más oscuros y más naranjas son los más ricos. Podemos ver así que, por ejemplo, hay países que tienen como Bolivia una gran dispersión y una separación entre los pobres y los ricos. Las mujeres pobres de Bolivia tienen tanto acceso como el grupo de mujeres de Panamá. Las mujeres ricas de Bolivia tienen todavía más acceso que las mujeres ricas de Ecuador o las de Argentina. Y así la podemos ver en México, en Trinidad y Tobago, que serían los dos que tienen mayor cobertura con menos dispersión, y los países que tienen menos dispersión pero con cobertura pobre para todos, como por ejemplo Surinam o Panamá. Por lo tanto, en este análisis podemos ver que dentro de los mismos países existe una gran dispersión y tendremos que trabajar para no dejar a nadie atrás, dado que la inequidad es mayor y peores son los resultados. Mostramos cuál podría ser el efecto de la disminución dada la pandemia del impacto que tendría la reducción de la anticoncepción. Y podemos analizar en cada uno de estos países, en estas poblaciones que son más pobres, que pertenecen al quintil de menores ingresos, que también son más vulnerables para todo el efecto de los determinantes sociales de la salud y así también de la pandemia. La siguiente, por favor. Con esto quiero dejar abierto el, el panel para poder compartir con ustedes la próxima. La próxima, por favor. Vamos a presentar todos los contenidos que van a estar en estas presentaciones que siguen. Están contenidos en este volumen especial del Journal de Figo, que está en inglés originalmente y luego fue traducido al español. Y está íntegramente traducido al español y Ados va a compartir en el chat el documento para todos ustedes y lo pueden bajar del sitio web de FIGO. Esto y mucha más información, hoy solo vamos a cubrir la costo efectividad, pero toda la información sobre cómo fue implementado este mega proyecto, hermoso proyecto que realmente ha venido a traer información que era muy necesaria en el mundo y especialmente útil para nuestra región de América Latina coordinada por el, pro, el profesor Aru Pulmarán, que nos va ahora a dar una conferencia sobre la perspectiva de la costo-efectividad de la anticoncepción. Profesor, lo escuchamos. Thank you very much uh, for the kind introduction. First, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Rodolfo Gómez. Uh, Susana and Syria from the PAHO for kindly accommodating this uh, symposium and also thanks to uh, our own obstetricians, our president of uh, FIGO, uh, who has kindly come as Carlos Fuchner and gave some introductory remarks, as well as to Edgar Ortiz, who kindly came to uh, participate in this seminar with his kind words. But I shouldn't forget Mandita Party and other people who has uh, given their help to organize this seminar. So my PPIUD team led by Anita will take over after my talk and in going into details, but let me start with my presentation. My first slide. Yeah, so the idea is actually how we can meet the unmet needs. You heard from uh, Dr. Rodolfo for the various problems within Latin America, but it is the same all over the world. The institutional deliveries are going up, but there is an unmet need globally of contraception. The next slide. This is actually to give you some idea, and I'm looking at my own papers. As you could see, there are 214 million women who had unmet need for contraception globally. And especially if you take the women who have delivered, 95% uh, of the women who are zero to 12 months after delivery are unable to get, uh, and 70% of them uh, are not using contraception. And if you look at the different countries, the number of cases coming for termination of pregnancy, 
are those because they have conceived the child much earlier. So if you can give postpartum contraception, uh, which is a serious issue, then we can not only space the family, give an economic break for the woman, and also spacing of the family will reduce miscarriage and preterm births and so on. Next slide. Now, if you look at the medical eligibility criteria by the WHO, there are different uh, methods which are used for postpartum contraception. And this slide really tells you about the long-acting reversible contraceptive methods, the pros and cons. The first column is the copper IUD, which comes under the WHO medical eligibility criteria number one for breastfeeding women. And it can be used up to 12 years, and the failure rate is less than 1%, and it's non hormonal And the only problem is it needs an internal examination to fit and needs a provider or a doctor or a midwife or a nurse to remove it. But they can return to fecundity to have a child as soon as it is removed. It might increase the menstrual flow slightly for the first six months or so, and Anita is doing some research in this area. So that is the number one recommended method, and the study from FIGO has shown the expulsion rate is less than 2.5% if you use a long cochlear forceps, which is 33 centimeters long and inserted at the fundus. The second recommended method by the WHO is the uh, the intrauterine marina system, which is a progestogen system. And uh, even though they are breastfeeding women, you can have it because the hormone released is very little. The effectiveness is only five years compared to the 12 years of the copper IUD. It's hormonal, but the failure rate is less than 1%. And you need an internal examination to insert it and the provider to remove it as well. It can also cause amenorrhea. So those who had Heavy menstrual period in the past might benefit by this by having it. The third is actually, which is catching up, is the implant. That is also WHO medical eligibility criteria number two. And it is suitable for breastfeeding women, useful for up to five years, and their failure rate is less than 1%. It is hormonal, and there's a need for a provider to insert it in the medial side of the arm and the provider to uh, remove it when the time comes. So if the woman wants to have a baby much earlier, you can get it removed in two or three years, like the other two methods. And return to fecundity, which is to have a child returns immediately after removal. And this also can produce the malaria because of the progesterone component. Next slide. Now, considering the medical eligibility criteria, looking at the COVID situation, the FIGO, under Professor Fuchner, Carlos Fuchner, came out with this uh, family planning advice. First is actually, although social distancing and limitations on mobility causes problem uh, for inpatient need, but the women who come for delivery, they are already there. So we should really make use of the opportunity to give long acting reversible contraceptive and especially postpartum IUD might be the best. Number two, self-care family planning methods should be promoted and supplied to women and men for pro proactively. So in other words, whichever the woman wants to have or the man wants to have can should be given. Barriers to accessing contraception need to be lifted. So there might be problem regarding supply chain. So this has to be looked into and implement uh, telemedicine using mobile phones and social media so you can communicate with them. And if you insert an implant or an IUD, the numbers in the hospital or the physician has to be given so they can consult with you if they have a problem. Or if the IUD comes out or the implant is causing pain. And we need to anticipate and address likely supply chain, as I mentioned earlier. And healthcare workers must be provided adequate personal protection equipment. So when they are going to make then they should also have personal protection equipment. So that way we can at least give those who are coming for delivery the possibility of having a long active reversible contraception. Next slide. The family planning should be considered as part of universal health access. So the definition of universal health coverage means that all individuals and communities receive the health services they need 
without suffering financial hardship. But all countries who commit to universal health coverage, it is vital that universal health coverage includes family planning and other reproductive health services. So sometimes it takes a sideline, so we have to focus and say that women get the best in terms of family planning and other reproductive health services. And integration of family planning into other health services, including maternity services, like the postpartum IUD, is a key approach to increasing access and should be considered with the universal health access promotion. So when FIGO started in 2014, the primary intention was to reduce maternal mortality and the abortion rates in countries. But now it has come in handy in terms of the COVID situation as well, because the women doesn't have to come again for another contraception. Next slide. The major issue is the financing for family planning. There is uh, increasing emphasis on the domestic financing for family planning services. If you could look at this slide, you can see 28% or so are paid by USCID, 28% by UNFPA. And what is given by the country itself is very little. So many lower and middle income countries spend less than 50% of their government budget on health, very little. And of that 15%, very little goes for contraception services. So significant proportions of contraception funding in low income countries from non-government funds. So if the donors stop the funding, then the contraception services also will collapse. So it's in a precarious situation regarding contraception. The cost for contraception is not so much. So let us see the next slide. This is a cost effectiveness study. It's a complex study. Anita will go through this in detail from the FIGO countries. But if you look at the uh, cross-like structure on, the, on your left side of the screen, and, and in the middle is the copper IUD, and it is comparing the methods of implant, the intrauterine system, the DMPA and combined oral contraceptive pill. So this is the one from the UK, as you could see, a rectangular bar at the top is oral contraceptives, combined oral contraceptives, which is very costly, and the failure rates are a little bit higher compared to if you're using copper IUD or DMPA. The figure on your right side of the screen is a study from Trussell from the United States, and if you really calculate it longitudinally over the years and find out about the cost effectiveness, then the lowest one is the copper IUD. Copper IUD costs a few US cents, so you can use it for 12 years, some might use it for three years or four years, but it is the most effective, similar to the progestogen and triutrine systems or implants, but it is very cost effective. So FIGO embarked on this because of the cost effectiveness the governments can afford, because as I showed you, it is dependent on donor money. So if the governments can pay, then we said we will do this uh, particular project. So the next slide will show you our plan, which we did in 2013. We did a phase one trial because there was a, a rumor saying that if you put a copper IUD soon after delivery with an open cervix, the copper IUD will fall out. So we wanted to really do the pilot study and make sure that we use a curved cochlear forceps, which is 33 centimeters long, and put it at the fundus of the uterus. We did the training on models called MAMA-U, and we showed the expulsion rate was uh, only less than 2.5% if we trained them properly. So we expanded the project in 2015, which is called Phase Two Project to India, Nepal, Bangladesh, Tanzania, Kenya, and we got nurses to insert, midwives to insert, junior doctors to insert after training, including the counseling. And 2018 to 2020 is sustainability so that we don't do anything, but whether it will be absorbed into the ordinary system and it is the current phase at the moment. So the aim was to institutionalize antenatal counseling for postpartum family planning and to offer postpartum IUB. And many countries have offered the marina system as well as the implant. And we did this study in 48 uh, re uh, reference hospitals in these countries. Next slide. So our theory of change was number one, to organize the leadership and governance. 
to capacity build the national ONG society through FIGO to advocate for the provision of postpartum family planning and had a national global advocacy by working with the ministries of health. And we have embedded postpartum family planning in national guidelines and policy in these six countries. Workforce is quite important and training of service providers in the postpartum counseling and insertion was done. And pre-service curriculum, we have introduced postpartum family planning and IUD. So many medical schools in these countries will teach the mama U model so the students can even insert an IUD. And we are promoting task sharing because the medical doctor workforce is not enough. So the midwives and nurses who did the training, they managed to put the IUD and it was equally successful. Then we concentrated on service delivery, which is the supply of counseling as well as facility level delivery of PPIUD. And we created demand in the population by using community health workers who were trained and they went around and showed how safe it is and the infection rate was very low, expulsion rate is low. So thereby more women came up to the services. And of course we monitored by data feedback for the strict data collection for six years. And we established through the data collected, the expulsion rate was very small as well as the infection rate was very small. And we also managed to introduce into the uh, standard government data collection system so they can continue to monitor the situation. And in many countries, the permanent method of fertilization came down and the insertion of PPIUD went up. The next slide provides the insight that I was mentioning that we had uh, 701,000 women counsel out of 1.2 million. We couldn't counsel everybody. Counseling is a major issue because in many countries, the doctors are very few to provide antenatal care. So they don't spend much time in counseling. So that's quite important. 12% of women consented to have a PPIUD and 74,000 women received the PPIUD till 2018, which is phase two. And that result of 74,000 was published in the publication which I also showed you all. And that shows the expulsion and infection rate to be extremely uh, small and for us to promote this. So my concluding slide is, next slide, uh, is postpartum family planning is a vital tool in addressing unmet need for contraception, which will help improve health social and economic outcomes of women and their wider families and societies because three years they can be economically viable as they face and they will have healthy children. PPD IUD is not only safe and effective but also convenient for postpartum women requiring a lot because the cervix is open, the uterus is much thicker and there's no way of perforating in inserting and you can insert it at the time of cesarean section as well. So recent history has demonstrated how fragile the provision of family planning methods in low and middle income countries with the COVID outbreak. So they will come for delivery anyhow to the hospital. So we should make use of the opportunity to provide postpartum contraception, especially by long acting reversible contraceptives. Cost is an important consideration for countries looking to support their own provision of contraceptive methods. And developing local evidence of cost effectiveness is one of the means of informing the allocation of healthcare resources to improve outcomes. So they will, their own country evaluation will be very useful. So I'm going to finish with that. Uh, and the next slide shows the reference of the team, of course, the various people, I mustn't forget quite a number of them. I can mention by name, but it will take too much of time. And the final slide is the references uh, which you can read uh, from the literature. And I'm sure Dr. Anita Makins will talk about the Tanzania and Bangladesh cost effectiveness and Christine Wall will talk about the experience in Rwanda. So with that, I, I like to thank uh, you all for giving me this opportunity and uh, Carlos and Figo team for giving me the opportunity to continue with this pro program, which Anita is uh, running the show and I'm just giving you needed support. Thank you very much.
Muchas gracias, profesor Alucumarán. Vamos a escuchar ahora a la coordinadora de este proyecto, la directora de este proyecto, que es la doctora Anita Mackins. Anita, por favor. Great. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, fantastic. Obrigada, eh, Rodolfo, pela, pela introdução. Sorry, I, eh, peço desculpas para os meus compatriotas eh, brasileiros. Eu não vou poder fazer em português, vou fazer em inglês, porque a gente não tinha tradução, mas... Uh, so anyway, thank you very much. I don't want to confuse the translators. I'll be doing the presentation in English. So thank you for the invitation. Uh, congratulations to CLAP uh, for your 50 years. Thank you, Suzani. Thank you, uh, uh, Rodolfo. Um, it's a great opportunity for us to be able to share this, this important work that, that we've done. Um, so I'm going to be talking to you about the cost effectiveness of the people PAUD initiative in two out of the six countries in which we work, so in Tanzania and um, Bangladesh. So next slide, please, Ados. So just again, to thank you very much for the FIGO uh, London team who are also online. Uh, thank you for the teams in country, the Bangladeshi team, the Tanzanian team, also the Ministry of Health in those two countries who are who were incredibly supportive during it all. Thank you, Professor Arul, again, uh, you conceived it and you directed it and, and you've given us support all the way through, which has been fantastic. And last but last not least, thank you to the anonymous donors who gave us the grant to go ahead with, with all of this, this work. Sorry, so next slide, please add us. And um, so just a breakdown of the, of the talk. Um, sometimes health economic talks can be a little bit dry, but I ask you to bear with us because um, I think the message at the end is quite an important one. So I have a brief introduction. We'll go through the methods. Then I'll talk about the results for the two countries, for Bangladesh and for Tanzania, and a brief discussion on the, the findings, and, and then we'll, we'll conclude. So next slide again. And so in terms of... Um, what we did, so the idea was to, to do the economic evaluation looking at our phase two data. So the phase two, as Professor Arul has already uh, outlined, was when we did our, the majority of our data collection and so it was more robust in terms of, of the analysis. Um, and the idea of this economic analysis was that it, was, it would help inform policy um, for, for the future, not only nationally for the two countries, but I think also at a global level, because there is actually very little about um, cost effectiveness of family planning methods in, in low and middle income countries. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so if we look at the table on the right here, you can see it's information from demographic health surveys for the two countries you can see that the unmet need for contraception so this is for ladies women who were uh, married between the ages of 15 and 49 um, the unmet need uh, in Bangladesh is 12 percent for Tanzania 22 percent um, when we look at the use of IUD so about 0.6 percent in Bangladesh 0.9 percent in Tanzania so not much of an uptake at all um, in terms of antenatal clinic consultation, so one uh, antenatal clinic appointment during pregnancies, about 82% in Bangladesh and up to 98 in Tanzania. And then institutional birth rates, so who comes to hospital to give birth? So in Bangladesh, only 50% of women, very different picture from what happens um, in South America or in the Americas. And in Tanzania, slightly higher, 60, nearly 63%. So, so this, this is the context. Um, to say that both countries nevertheless, nevertheless have policies which support immediate postpartum contraception. So when you look at the government guidance, etc. But there's great limitation in terms of implementation of that. So actually translating that into practice. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of uh, what was done briefly about the, the, with regards to the initiative, we had central project teams, a team uh, in uh, Tanzania. We worked predominantly with AGOTA, the Association of Gynecologists and Obstetricians of Tanzania. And we also worked with TAMA, the Tanzanian Midwifery Association. And then in Bangladesh, we worked with OGSB, that's the Gynecology and Obstetrics Association of Bangladesh. Um, and through those, those, those local teams we worked in, we selected six uh, teaching referral hospitals. 
um, and we worked with the existing clinical staff to train them in counselling and also insertion uh, methodology of the IUD. In Bangladesh, we did also employ specific um, uh, family planning counsellors because their throughput in terms of in antenatal clinics, the amount of time that doctors and nurses could actually spend with um, patients was, was really small and so there we did add counsellors but that wasn't the case in Tanzania. Um, and the counselling was done during antenatal care visits or um, if they came in early labour or sometimes in the postpartum period as long as it was within 48 hours. And the PPIUD was then inserted before discharge, so within, within 48 hours. Next slide, please. So moving on to, to our methodology, I'll try not to dwell too much on the different uh, health economic aspects, but just to give an overview. The next slide again, Ados. Um, so the scope really was to look at the incremental cost of adding postpartum uh, contraception counselling and then insertion of uh, the PPIUD delivery um, to, to standard postpartum contraception practice at those participating facilities. But what we actually saw was that um, the standard of practice uh, in the facilities was that there wasn't really any method of immediate contraception being provided. So really uh, the PPIUD counselling in the first place of all methods and then PPIUD insertion on top of that was um, was the only was the only uh, work that was being done in terms of postpartum family planning. Generally speaking, women were advised to come back at six weeks, and that's actually how most maternity settings around the world would would run. So it's a little bit of a new concept still. To mention, however, that tubal ligation was offered, uh, particularly in Bangladesh, to women who were having a cesarean section, but not to those who were having normal delivery in Tanzania. It was actually quite rare in the facilities we were working. So next slide, please. Um, so in terms of the costing, the approach we use, so we were very much looking at it from a government perspective. Um, so we wanted to know how much it would, it would have cost for the government and how much it would cost to the government to expand rather than um, you know, an international intervention or, or, or something coming from outside. And so we uh, looked at the cost, uh, we didn't look at the cost to women uh, or, or society as such, but the government implementation. We used very much a bottom up a micro costing method. So that means that we collected primary data on the actual costs and using existing data where it was possible. And there was some additional data which needed to be collected. For example, how long it took to do counseling, how long it took to actually in, do insertions and also the value of, of provider time uh, spent. We excluded some costs because we didn't feel they were reflective of, of the cost to implement. Um, we excluded the costs which, which were sort of uh, FIGO wise and you know from an international uh, venue kind of trying to run it and and the fact that it was donor funded and we also excluded any costs that were related to research because that also wouldn't be necessary if it was going to be um, implemented uh, nationally on a, on a wider scale and the costs are presented in uh, us dollars for 2018 um, and we did include a 10 percent overhead cost and this is consistent with standard costing practice practice and, and overhead rates used in, in both of the two countries so that's why that was done. Uh, next slide please. So the costs that were included, so we included um, costs of provide, uh, trainer, uh, training of providers in terms of not only the contraceptive counselling but also insertion and you can see the, the photograph on the right is an example of a training that's going on in Bangladesh where we use the Mama U model to teach uh, healthcare providers how to insert the IUD after a normal delivery. Um, we included staff salaries, uh, honorarium payments to the different heads of departments in the different hospitals, uh, the cost of reusable clinical equipment like for example the Kelly's forceps which is the longer forceps that we use to insert the, um, the PPIUD. And then we use something called the lifetime direct PPIUD service cost, which means that it's the cost of the IUD in the long run. So not only insertion, um, but also a follow up visit and, uh, and eventual removal. Um, and we excluded actually the cost of complications. 
this again is quite a standard way of doing it, but also when we did look at the cost of complications, so firstly the incidence of complications was very low and then the cost was so little that it didn't actually make any significant difference to the, to the results, so those were excluded. Um, and then we did add in the cost of supporting activities. So for example, behavioral change materials, uh, like we had pamphlets and leaflets published um, or videos. Also, we would play videos in the antenatal clinic so that women could familiarize themselves with the information before they actually had their appointment and the counseling. We also included any expenses on advocacy, project management and um, monitoring. Next slide, please. So in terms of the outcomes, uh, we were looking at um, what's called an incremental cost effectiveness ratio. So it's the ICERs and it, it sounds complicated, but actually it's a very simple uh, uh, idea. It's, it's looking at the cost of the PPIUD initiative minus the cost of standard practice, which in this case was none because there wasn't any other PPFP being uh, offered. And then we put that over the outcomes of the initiative minus the outcomes of standard practice. And these ICERs are then reported as cost per PPIUD inserted, um, cost per couple year of protection. And we use the CY, CYPs uh, from the USAID have estimated. So for the copper coil, that's 4.6 years. Um, and the cost per estimated DALI, so disability adjusted life year, averted and so these are just standard. I don't think we need to worry too much about the ins and outs of those. It's more just to look at the comparison and just to understand roughly what, what outcomes are. So um, if, if we move on to the next slide, this um, is quite an easy way to uh, visualize the, the results that you get when you look at the at implementation costs. So the idea is a cost effectiveness plane. So if we move from left to right along the line of effectiveness, we're basically going from a method that's not very effective, so less effective than the one you're testing. And as you move along to the right, you get to the methods which are most effective. Um, and then if we move from the bottom of the graph upwards, then this is the line uh, pertaining to cost. So at the bottom of, the, of that line, you would be a method which is cost saving comparatively. And then as you move up, you come to cost neutral in the middle. And if you're right at the top, then you're an expensive method. And that would be where you would be trying to work out where your method would fit once you get your results. So you're hoping really for a method which sits either in the top right, which is an, a method which is a little bit is more expensive than what you already have, but is more, effect, more effective. And so then your question is, can we actually afford to give a more effective method? Or even better is one in the bottom right quadrant, which is a, a method which is not only cheaper, but also more effective. And if your method is in the bottom right corner, then it would be crazy not to take it on because you're basically saving money in the long run and you have a more effective method. So I'll refer back to this, this cost effectiveness plane when we look at the results. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms, in terms of the key outcomes we used, uh, something called the IMPACT2 two, two tool, which was developed by Mary Stobbs International. And it basically uh, allows you to estimate the wider health and societal impacts of delivering the family planning, planning method, which in this case um, is the PPIUD. So we looked, so it looks at the estimates for DALIs averted, so disability adjusted life years averted. So that's based on pregnancies and pregnancy, pregnancy related deaths or illnesses that would have been averted. And then secondly, it estimates the longer term health savings to the government. For example, if people use more IUDs, then you avert costs associated with pregnancy related services like antenatal care, delivered, deliveries, post-abortion care, et cetera, and complications. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of the analysis, we had, we developed two models. Uh, the first model was looking at the actual costs of the PPIUD initiative in the six hospitals in each of the countries. So this gave, gave us the cost 
of what the, IU, the PPIUD initiative was. Um, uh, and then in model two, what we did was we were extrapolating those results into what it would cost the government if they wanted to expand it at a national level. So for Bangladesh and Tanzania separately. So for Bangladesh, we're looking at scaling up to all of the medical colleges, college hospitals at a national level. So those were 36 extra hospitals. And in Tanzania, it was scaling up to all the regional referral hospitals nationally. So that's to 28 referral hospitals. We didn't look at, we didn't add in the costs of, um, for example, peripheral health centers, although we did do a sub analysis of that in the sensitivity analysis, but we focused on, on uh, this model of, of rolling it out to the regional hospitals because that was the most similar to what we had done actually in the initiative itself. So it made it most, most accurate. So next slide, please, Ados. Yeah, so we can move on to the results um, of the Bangladesh study. So next slide again, please. So in terms of Bangladesh, so this table here, and there's lots of numbers on it, I'll just explain briefly the ones that matter the most. So the first column is model one. So that's the initiative as we did it in the six hospitals. So you can see the number of facilities, six. And then if you move down that column, you get to uh, estimated total cost. So you can see there that it costs the PPIUD initiative about half a million US dollars to implement in those six, in those six facilities. And then when you put that, the information was put into the, the costing tool, you can see at the bottom there, impact two estimated direct healthcare costs saved. So the initiative the results of the initiative meant that the government saved 802,000 US dollars. So it cost us less to implement the initiative than was actually saved to the government in terms of um, unplanned pregnancies or complications of labor, etc. cetera. Um, so uh, that, makes it, that makes it highly cost effective uh, because you, you spend uh, less than you save in the long run. So then if we then extrapolate model two is the second or the third column along or the heading model two, you can see there that when you expand it to 36 facilities so across the country, the estimated cost would be just under 2 million US dollars for Bangladesh. Um, and then if we move down to the impact two estimation, uh, you can see there that the savings to the government would be two and a half million dollars. So for the government in Bangladesh to roll it out as we did, um, they would save two and a half million dollars, but it would cost them just under two million dollars. So they have a saving of, of over uh, half a million dollars there. So again, very cost effective, highly cost effective uh, method. So, and then if we move on to the next slide. So here um, we're looking sort of more specifically at those different outcomes I mentioned before. So number of IUDs inserted, uh, and the cost per IUD inserted, the cost per um, couple year protection gain, the cost per DALI averted, uh, the cost in terms of maternal deaths averted and child deaths averted. I think probably the one to concentrate on is if we look at the DALIs averted. So you can see there $91.13 is the cost per DALI averted. And in, in health economic talk, we say that if the cost per DALI averted is less than the per capita GDP of that country, uh, then it's a, it's a very highly a co a cost effective method. And you can see the, uh, my paragraph bottom right, the cost per DALI um, is $91, but the, the per capita GDP for Bangladesh is 1,698. So well below that threshold and therefore making it a highly cost effective intervention. This is for model one. And so then if we move on to the next slide. This is the same information, but for model two. So just remember that model two is expanding it at a national level to cover the whole country. And you can see that it remains a very highly cost effective. So the DALI's averted there, the cost is $106.64. Um, and again, comparing it to a GDP of 1,698, you can see that it's a highly cost-effective cost method. So if we were looking back at that plane, um, it shows that the PPIUD um, intervention would fit in the bottom right. So not only are you cost-saving, but you're also more effective in the method that you're using. Um, so we were very pleased, pleased with these results. 
we move on to the next slide, please, Ados? So these are the results uh, for Tanzania. So we can skip again to the next slide. So similar, they're exactly the same tables, but this time looking at Tanzania. Um, so here, the first, uh, the second column along is model one. And um, so this is the PPIUD initiative as it stood in the six facilities in, uh, that we worked in. You can see the estimated cost of the initiative for us then was uh, just under $2 million for Tanzania, so 1.8 or nearly 1.9. And then if you look further down at the bottom uh, row for the impact to estimated direct healthcare costs saved, we saved the government $1.3 million. Um, so you save slightly less than you spent, but still uh, very close to the two numbers. So, so still uh, considered cost effective. And then if we look at model two, which is when you're extrapolating nationally for Tanzania. So you're moving now to, to the 28 facilities within the country. The estimated cost is nearly 7 million US dollars. So 6.9 million US dollars. And if we move down to the bottom right for the impact to estimated healthcare costs saved, you're saving nearly $8 million, so $7.9 million. So you can see that for Tanzania, once you extrapolate uh, to, to covering the country because of uh, savings uh, secondary to um, expansion, you, you then become highly cost effective. So you save uh, more money than you actually spend to roll it out. And so again, if we move to the next, slide. So this again is the same table looking at those specific outcomes that I talked about before. So PPIUD inserted, uh, cost per CYP gained, cost per DALI averted. So if we stop at that one, cost per DALI averted in Tanzania was $67.67. And if you look at my paragraph on the right, the GDP per capita for Tanzania is 1,051. So well below their GDP per capita and therefore a highly cost effective method. And this is model one. So this is uh, just for the six facilities that we we worked in. Um, if we move on to the next slide, uh, so this is model two. So again, if we look at DALI's averted, uh, we move across three columns to the cost per outcome achieved. You can see they're $43.31. And, and if we compare this to the GDP per capita of Tanzania um, of 1,051, you can see that it's highly cost effective and actually becomes very highly cost effective. Uh, so look, thinking back at the cost effectivity plane that I showed, the different quadrants, this again would sit in the bottom right quadrant um, in that it is cheaper and more effective than, than other methods of, of contraception, uh, than, than not implementing it, sorry, rather than other methods of contraception. So thank you, Adosia. So moving on to the discussion and the conclusion, you can skip again. So um, the key findings really that in uh, introduction and national scale up of PPIUD was estimated to be highly cost effective for both countries, both for Bangladesh uh, and for Tanzania. Um, we weren't able to directly compare PPIUD to, to other methods. Um, but generally in the literature, uh, because we know, for example, that implants uh, have a much higher commodity cost. Um, I think Kristen also will talk in her next uh, lecture about more com comparison between the two, but the feeling is that the PPIUD uh, would be much cheaper. We didn't include implants in this initiative uh, because actually when we started, they were not available in country. So we only wanted to use methods that the government was uh, supplying free of charge uh, to, to women. And so in terms of long acting reversible contraceptive methods, that was the, the PPIUD was the only one, the, the hormonal actually, the IUS, the intrauterine system is not available um, in, in, in Tanzania or Bangladesh, so also not an, not an option. Um, and we could just mention that when you compare it to immediate postpartum tubal ligation, which was the one other method that was available in Bangladesh, um, uh, because the government, um, also incentive, gives incentives to women depending on which kind of contraceptive method they take up. 
actually for PPI UD it would also also be cheaper but I, I don't like to compare those methods because they're different for a woman if you're never going to have children again compared to you may want to have children in the future it's not really directly comparable um, and also of course we must remember that choice is, is paramount because actually if a woman takes a method on that she's doesn't really want, then she's not going to keep it in. So it needs to be, it needs to be something that suits suits each lady. Uh, next slide, please. So just to conclude, um, so obviously we've got a very compelling case for governments and international donors in Bangladesh and Tanzania to invest in the provision of quality contraceptive counseling, because I think that's key actually to, for women to then agree to the IUD. Um, and that there should be routine um, inclusion of um, PPIUD uh, within whatever range of contraceptive methods each country, in con each country has available to them. And that these investments, when we look at our uh, model two, um, that if they're expanded, you know, would be cost saving to the government and, and improve the outcomes for women and children and families. And I think probably also important to mention that it will help just with the development of the country if this is truly expanded you know um, it means that women are able better able to look after the children that they do have because they probably will have fewer of them but more importantly they will be planned but they will also have time to do whatever else they had planned to do with their lives and contribute to society other than um, sort of being being um, having no, no sort of contraceptive choices or reproductive choices in terms of their life. Thank you. So I'll hand over to Dr. Christine, I think. Rodolfo, would you like to introduce or? Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, Anita. Muchas gracias por tu presentación magnífica. Eh, le queríamos pedir a Christine eh, si podría ajustarse lo máximo que pueda al horario, así tenemos espacio para las preguntas. Muchas gracias eh, de la Universidad de Emory. Escuchamos con mucha atención a la doctora Christine Ward. Thank you so much and um, wonderful presentation, Anita. Um, and hello, thank you again for that very kind introduction and this wonderful opportunity to present today in what is a, a really important webinar series and special thanks to, um, to Dr. Rodolfo and, and Suzanne and to Figo and the organizers. Um, again, my name is Kristen Wall and I'll be presenting um, the cost effectiveness findings from our postpartum family planning service implementation that took place in Kigali, which is the capital of, of Rwanda, a very small country in, in Africa. Um, I will be presenting findings related to both postpartum IUD insertion and postpartum implant. Next slide, please. So by way of very brief background, um, as, as we've already discussed, the WHO recommends postpartum family planning for prevention of unintended pregnancy, birth spacing, and maternal newborn health. And in countries across Africa, and including in Rwanda, postpartum family planning services are recommended with a strong emphasis on um, the postpartum LARC methods. LARC being the long-acting um, reversible contraceptives. In this context, um, that is specifically the copper intrauterine device and the hormonal implants. Um, as we've heard, LARCs are safe, user-independent, highly effective, and can generally be used during postpartum periods. Uh, want to delay uh, uh, globally and 51 Christian can you hear us there's a problem in the sound you get priest. Está frisada la imagen de 
la doctora Christine Wall seguramente ha tenido algún inconveniente en la conexión. Vamos a tratar de restablecerlo a la brevedad posible. I'm sorry to interrupt, but if I may suggest you should share only the application, not your monitor, because we can see everything you have on your monitor. Kristen, are you there? Bueno, tenemos un problemita. She tenemos is problemas. there, but she was muted. She's pleased. Looks like she's freezed. Okay, you are back. Go ahead, please. I'm reconnected. Okay, ap apologies. You can hear me. Yes, yes, perfectly. Go ahead, please. She's having some problems in the connection. We are so sorry for that. Uh, we have some technical inconvenience, but uh, we will be solving. In the meantime, we have some questions uh, from the from the panel, and I want to uh, answer maybe the first. Uh, Uh, Jill Gay asked about the timing or the, when uh, the Lancet publication is uh, was published and uh, the data is coming from where. And uh, and I want to say that it was published last year, and uh, the data is coming from 2008 to to 2015 was the last was the last data and uh, some countries like Nicaragua that have uh, the last uh, DHS was in 2006. We use the last available DHS data. Only for Nicaragua, that was the, 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 the eldest. Rodolfo, would you like me to answer some of the PPIUD related questions in the chat box whilst we're waiting? Yes, uh, sure. The next questions are maybe, you know, for uh, Anita. That is uh, Rafael Esquiavon from Mexico asked about the uh, real time continuity rate of IUD use in those countries right now. And if task sharing could reduce the costs. Yeah, so so actually we have a paper in the making looking at uh, the long-term outcomes of the ladies in Tanzania. Um, and um, oh, this is off the top of my head, but the retention, people at uh, one year, I think it was something like 92%, something like that, but it, it hopefully it will be published soon. 92% of ladies who had chosen the IUD still had the IUD in a year down the line and were happy with the method. Um, in terms of the task sharing question, so I didn't really mention any of that, but um, actually the two countries were quite different in that respect. So in Tanzania, uh, there was task sharing with the, I meant uh, task sharing with midwives. So basically the, the majority actually of PPIUDs inserted in Tanzania were done by midwives, not doctors. Um, and I didn't comment on the main cost drivers for the two countries because I think that's also part of the, the one of the other questions that's on the on the question and answer uh, slides. Uh, that um, for for Bangladesh, the main cost driver was actually the facility staff. But this was because in Bangladesh we were paying for counselors, so these were lay women who helped the doctors and the nurses with counselling on family planning. 
Um, and so that drove the costs of um, staff upwards. But actually for Tanzania, the biggest cost was training. And this is because we were task sharing, the midwifery uh, training was actually quite a bit longer than the training that was done in Bangladesh, which was predominantly for doctors. And Tanzania has a very specific structure in terms of, of training, a very standardized structure. And so it, it was quite a long uh, two, weeks, two weeks of training. Um, and so within our sensitivity model, we try to demonstrate actually to the um, to readers that if you reduce the training time, which we believed was, was possible in Tanzania, that actually you would reduce the cost by quite a lot. But that was why in Tanzania, if you go back to the slides, I think you'll get it at the end, you'll see that the main driver was actually uh, training in terms of cost, but actually for Bangladesh, it was facility staff because of the counselors. So it's interesting how it varied from one country to another. Thanks, Odo. And there was a question also, um, I'll keep filling in the time whilst we're waiting for Kristin. Um, there's a question from Sharad Iyengar. So for PPIUD over and above the cost of insertion is a cost of adverse, infect, uh, adverse effects and whether we included that. So actually our complication rates were extremely low. Um, and that's in, if you're interested in the detail of it, please check the supplement. So the link that's been given to the IJGO supplement, we published a paper uh, with regards to complications across the six countries. So when the health economists factored that in, actually the, the cost was so low um, that it was just removed. And I think this is standard practice. I mean, I think you're right that some of the costs are sometimes borne by the women themselves, but actually our complication rates were so low that they didn't really impact significantly on the cost estimation. So there was a decision made to leave them out. That was the thinking. Hello, this is Kristen. I, I think I'm back. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Fine. Yes, we can hear you. Well, I'm not sure if there's time to, to resume or if you'd rather proceed with questions. And I apologize. We're having a little bit of weather here, but I am now connected to my hotspot. So hopefully this should work. Rodolfo, are you there? Maybe, Kristen, if you can go directly to the conclusions, uh, just to share maybe the, 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 key quick, the, the key answers, and then we can share later on the full presentation for people, it would be great. Sure, we I think that's it. We over all the time right now, but uh, if you can go there, please. Sure, I think that's a, a great idea. Um, so if we could just move back to, um, I think this, this is a great slide. So we, um, similarly to what Anita presented, um, we, you know, we, we rolled out a postpartum family planning um, service delivery program. We were focused on um, delivering the implant and the IUD. We calculated various costs actually quite similarly to what um, uh, Anita described and using similar methods. And we found that um, the cost per um, IUD insertion was $25 per insertion, and the cost per implant insertion was 77, so, so quite a bit higher. And then the cost per couple year protection similarly was much lower for the IUD. And I just wanted to highlight that there, um, you know, as, as Anita mentioned, there are relatively few um, studies of the cost effectiveness of postpartum contraception, but I wanted to just show um, um, a few studies for comparability that are not that were not calculated in postpartum periods to give you a sense of of the range of these studies and just to point out that in general the IUD does seem to have a relatively low cost per couple year protection versus the other reversible methods and um, and also lower versus the implant the other LARC method so if you can go to the last slide please so just in terms of final considerations, I didn't have time to, to describe all of this, but our, our intervention was really focused on supply, demand, and sustainability. Um, in terms of supply, we, we did show that the government staff could deliver very consistent quality postpartum family planning services where the providers were, were 
um, you know, found the service to be adaptable with their workload. Um, certainly over longer periods of time, new and refresher trainings um, will be needed, which will have ongoing cost implications. In terms of demand, um, uh, postpartum um, LARC demand and uptake increased significantly during our program. And we generated demand both in the clinic, in the community, and among men. And I, I do want to highlight that men were a very important part of our program. And I think that in many countries around the world, um, you know, we've seen that male involvement and family planning decisions is critical. Um, hopefully, the idea is as people become more aware of these services through social diffusion, demand creation activities, which similar to Anita's work were, were very expensive for us, um, could, could ultimately be reduced. So also having some cost implications. Um, and then in terms of sustainability, um, you know, we, we found this relatively low cost per, per insertion and couple year protection and, um, you know, ongoing training and reimbursement for providers uh, may improve the sustainability of, of postpartum family planning service use in, in cost effective ways. And I will end there. And I apologize again. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Kristen. Muchas gracias, Kristen. Uh, aquí, lamentablemente, eh, tenemos que terminar esta sesión que ha despertado muchísimo interés. Hemos tenido durante esta sesión cerca de 200 participantes y esto va a ser compartido en tres canales de eh, YouTube, tanto de la Organización Mundial de la Salud, de FIGO y además de la OPS. Queremos pedirle eh, que no se olviden que cuando hablamos de costo efectividad también hablamos de 100 muertes maternas evitadas en Tanzania, además del costo, eh, y que esto no tiene un, un valor, no tiene un precio. Sin embargo, estamos tratando de promover esta, este tipo de análisis. Sabemos que el gerenciamiento de recursos cuando estos son muy escasos es muy importante y es crucial. Por eso era la importancia de este, de este seminario. Y le vamos a dar la palabra al doctor, eh, el presidente de FIGO, el doctor Carlos Fusner, y a la doctora Susana Cerrulla para el cierre de, esta, de este seminario. Y agradecemos muchísimo la participación de todos y vamos a responder por vía email a las preguntas que quedaron sin poder responderse. Agradecemos muchísimo el interés y la participación de todos. Susan, Carlos, el micrófono es de ustedes. Muchas gracias, Rodolfo. Muchas gracias a todos. Eh, ha sido una excelente mañana. Las presentaciones muy claras. Y nosotros queremos con eso que cada uno de ustedes pueda usar eso para entrenar más profesionales, para diseminar esta información. Como hablamos es un momento más que nunca de no dejar nadie atrás. Desafortunadamente, también la pandemia ha dejado más claro las desigualdades. Nosotros vimos en los casos, en las muertes, que cuanto mayor la vulnerabilidad, más alta la vulnerabilidad, más caso de, casos de pandemia y casos de muerte tuvimos. Así estamos seguros que las mujeres que tienen menos acceso son las que más necesitan. Y nosotros debemos trabajar para que a cada mujer tenga la oportunidad de tener su derecho en salud sexual y reproductiva cumplido. Sí, muchas gracias a todos y seguimos a exposición desde CLAP para muchos años más. Muchas gracias. Carlos. Gracias, Susan. Gracias, Rodolfo. Gracias a todos los participantes. En el nombre de FIGO, quiero aclarar que este estudio del postpartum IUD fue un trabajo llevado a conciencia, siete años de dedicación de, de FIGO y de su gente. Los resultados son contundentes y yo no lo consideraría, también existe la traducción en español, gracias Rodolfo por hacerme recuerdo, eh, no lo consideraría como un gasto, sino lo consideraría como una inversión. 
es una inversión extremadamente barata que tiene un impacto social importante. Yo creo que tenemos la generación de evidencia que tenga un impacto en la salud eh, sexual y reproductiva de nuestras mujeres, no solamente en nuestra América Morena, sino en el mundo entero, es nuestra obligación. Eh, todos nosotros tenemos que sentirnos orgullosos de este webinar, gracias a la eh, inferencia y el trabajo de Anita y Rodolfo. Muchísimas gracias. Por supuesto, gracias a todos nuestros parceros, en este caso, Frasoc, OPS y el CLAP. Siempre bienvenidos y siempre a su orden. Muchas gracias y por favor, estén seguros en casa y cuídense del COVID que todavía nos quiere matar. Gracias. Con esas lindas palabras cerramos el webinar y va a quedar grabado para todos nosotros compartir luego con nuestros colegas. Agradecemos al doctor Iván Ortiz. Muchísimas gracias en nombre de Flasoc y vamos a compartir esto con todos los colegas de la región. Muchísimas gracias. Y cerramos con honores este webinar. Gracias. Un abrazo. Gracias.